So guys, welcome to the JPS podcast. I am with another podcast host now, Greg Knuckles. So he is very much familiar with uh, how these things roll on um, both ends, which is very cool. Welcome, Greg. Thanks for having me. And and j- just to clarify, um, you're, you're not I'm not host. actually a podcast host. <laughs> I'm a I'm a temporary guest co-host for <laughs> another so. podcast, which but so so far I've been uh, I've been holding on to that. Is that with Eric Helms? Um, so common misconception it's it's Eric Trexler, but uh, I mean they're effectively interchangeable. They're both named Eric. They both have PhDs in something related to our space. They both are bodybuilders. Like I have a hard time telling them apart personally. And, and honestly, so a lot of people think that they're the same person. I will say I've seen them both in the same room at the same time. However, there is the possibility that it is just one person moving back and forth really quickly mm-hmm. to present the illusion that it's two people. Um, so I, I think they're separate entities, but I can't I can't rule out the possibility that they may be the same person. Mm. There's uh, yeah, definitely a case for that. So, guys, you've been warned officially. Uh, Eric Helms and Eric Trixler, most likely the same person, but we can't confirm. So, in today's episode, we're going to talk about uh, the effective reps concept. It's great that this is still uh, transferring across podcasts. It's um, it's brilliant that that joke's uh, going around. Uh, we're going to talk about the effective reps concept uh, in, and an article Greg recently wrote uh, discussing the topic. But before we get into things, I wanted to give a little bit of a background as to an email exchange that Greg and I had, because I think it'll lay an important foundation for the rest of the conversation. So the initial conversation, uh, Greg was a little hesitant to come on the show and talk about this. He originally said yes, and then he flaked it on me and said, no, I don't want to talk, (laughs) Uh, because he didn't want to go on tour on the fitness space, criticizing someone else's ideas. And I really respect that, to be honest. And he said all that he wanted to say. I presume that he meant in his article when he said that. And that uh, answering the stimulus changing across a set with varying exercises. So this is in relation to the effective reps concept uh, with changing levels of advancement. Uh, You know, he can't say much beyond saying all single joint studies use untrained subjects and all multi-joint studies use trained subjects. So we don't know which of those factors is causing the disparate findings. Um, and yeah, he was just a little bit hesitant to, uh, give much more than that. And my response to Greg was that, uh, I agreed with him on all fronts really. And, uh, I thought that there would be benefits, uh, for folks to hear exactly why, uh, you know, he felt this way and the reasons why his theoretical model for hypertrophy, um, you know, still vague, can't be used to prescribe training. And, uh, yeah, I think that people can still learn a lot from the nuance, ambiguity, and uncertainty surrounding hypertrophy because if you have read Greg's article, it's pretty much where we're at. We don't know a a hell of a lot. And Greg then responded with, ah, fuck it. Let's see how it goes. So here we are, (laughs) and I'm very grateful that he's come on. So I just wanted to make that known because Greg is somebody whose time I really respect. So I'm very appreciative that he's here. So, Greg, why do you feel, number one, that you've said all you've said and wanted to say uh, on the matter of effective reps? Well, so just some background from my end of the discussion. Um, So one, just in general, uh, typically, like I've done basically every podcast out there in kind of our side of the fitness industry at this point. And how that tends to go is people ask me questions that are basically just asking me to reiterate stuff that I've already said and already written, which is like, it's fine that, you know, I'm sure that like our audiences don't have 100% crossover. You probably want to expose your audience to some of the things that I've said, but there's a part of me that's like, this feels like wasted time almost because it's like just tell people to read the article like that's if if you want me to just regurgitate an article in audio format just tell people to read the article um 
So on one hand, I, I'm not crazy about podcasts where I very much get the vibe that people are like, oh, I just read this new article of yours. Can you please come on my podcast and basically recite the article for my audience? Um, and then the other thing, and I think more importantly, is that um, like I'm, I'm not someone who seeks out conflict. Um, and I, I kind of got the feeling. So at this point, when we publish a new article, um, within the next four, like 24 to 48 hours, I'm going to get at least half a dozen people who say like, Hey, do you want to come on and talk about this article? Um, and in this case, you were the first person who emailed uh, I know you, I like you, I like your podcast, you do good stuff. So I was like, ah, sure, I can do that. And then within the next about two days, I got probably 15 or 20 more emails. And I was like, oh, like this article is getting a lot more attention than previous ones. It's probably because people smell possible impending drama. And I try to avoid that like the plague when possible. Um, and so it... I didn't get this from you, but I got this from some people in general that they were like, oh, let's see if we can drum up some controversy between Greg and Chris Beardsley and like whatever. So um, that's that's why I attempted to pull out because I was like, yeah, like I, I can talk about the concept. I don't really want to talk about the same concept 30 times on 30 different podcasts. And I'm certainly not trying to cause drama or conflict. Um so yeah, uh, yours is the only podcast other than my own that I'm going to do on this topic. So uh, anyway, hopefully what, it goes well an and, uh, and and doesn't blow up in our faces too bad. <laughs> yes, uh, hopefully not. Uh, but no, I, I do respect that because I think a lot of uh, the evidence-based uh, fitness community and the podcasts within it uh, very much have the same people on. And they say the same things about the same things over and over. And you can literally guarantee that, you know, within the month, you're going to have the same person who's the flavor of that month uh, come on and talk about all the same things. And uh, that's not what I want. I've actually gone a different direction with my podcast. I'm sure you're not uh, staying up to date with things. So I'll let you know that uh, I'm only interviewing people now who I find interesting and who I think will have something interesting to say. Uh, so I'm not doing the whole, oh, he's been on that podcast, so I better interview him now. I'm not doing that anymore. It's taking a very different direction, which means there's less, but hopefully more from the podcast. Uh, but back to the concept of effective reps. I listened to the Eric uh, Trexler podcast uh, that you're a guest on, and <laughs> I really strongly agreed with uh, his, I guess, assessment of the utility of the model in that it came in a time where hard sets uh, was, you know, it had been around for a couple of years and people had sort of started to see that, oh, well, hard sets doesn't really tell you much beyond the set was hard, really. Um, and the effective reps uh, concept was a little more uh, specific and yeah, granular in that it tried to tell you how many reps within that hard set you were actually getting a stimulus for growth for. So uh, do you want to just lay the foundations quickly on what effective reps is in a nutshell and then where you have, uh, I guess, identified some of the limitations and the flaws within the model? Yeah, so um, th the the concept of effective reps, there's, there's multiple iterations of the concept. Um, and so I, I think the earliest one that I was exposed to that was a bit less formalized was um, I'm going to I'm going to butcher his name. And someone told me how to pronounce his name. Hell yeah. There you go. Now I don't have to say it. Um, so, yeah, he he had a concept where it, it wasn't it wasn't like a binary thing. It was essentially the idea that. Um, as you get closer to failure, you're recruiting more and more motor units, you're producing more and more fatigue. Uh, the motor units that are recruited, maybe rate coding is picking up a little bit. And so you're possibly getting more tension on those fibers. And so that 
it's it's kind of like a progressive thing that you know the the first rep in a set it's not as if that is no stimulus whatsoever but it's probably not doing too much for you and then as a set progresses and you get closer and closer to failure reps become progressively more effective in terms of the per rep stimulus for promoting hypertrophy um and in I actually quite like that idea. Um, and so that, I guess, kind of like rose and fell in 2012, 2013. Then people kind of stopped talking about that concept as much for a few years. And since then, it's been revitalized, um, like last summer in a pretty big way by Chris Beardsley. And Chris's conception of effective reps is... So I, I want to be careful to not strawman Chris's position, but the way his articles read is that it's like a much more binary thing, um, insofar as the five reps or like up to five reps from failure, it's essentially ineffective. It's not really doing much of anything to promote hypertrophy, and then the five reps prior to failure are all quote unquote effective reps and do stimulate hypertrophy. So essentially, you know, if you push a set to failure, you get five effective reps in that set, uh, assuming it's a set of more than five reps and, you know, you do push it all the way to failure. Um, if you stop two reps shy of failure, you're doing three effective reps such that, uh, according to this model, uh, set to two reps in reserve or eight RPE, would be about 60% as effective at promoting growth as a set all the way to failure. Um, and so that's, that's the, the basic idea. And it's, um, it's predicated on, it's predicated on the idea that, um, at about five reps from failure is probably when you're getting full motor unit recruitment of the prime movers. And also as, um, as rep speed decreases based on the force velocity relationship, um, the force each fiber is producing increases such that really close to failure, you're maximizing uh, tension per fiber um, for, for the actively recruited motor units. Um, and with tension being seemingly the primary uh, initiator and driver of hypertrophy, um, getting down to close enough to failure that even when you're moving reps fast, they're moving slow. Um, that is maximizing like per muscle fiber tension to, to promote high, a, a meaningful amount of hypertrophy per rep. Um, so I, I think that's the basic concept. Um, and hopefully, hopefully I, I've accurately relayed that and not, um, misrepresented or, or misinterpreted anything. Yeah, no, I think that's a pretty fair assessment of what the model is. And I guess, as you've mentioned multiple times, the issue comes with people's reductionist, uh, you know, mentality when it comes to these kind of models, um, whether that's on Chris's uh, part in you know displaying and presenting the model or just their uh, interpretation of it. But people have inevitably seen that, well, at rep five, then it's effective and then anything below, uh, you know, an RPA five or five reps from failure is ineffective. And that's why I kind of like James Krieger's model um, a little bit more because it didn't have the um, same terminology around effective and ineffective. It was strongly hypertrophic versus weakly hypertrophic. And was a much more of a sliding scale than an on and off switch. What are you smoking at, Greg? <laughs> um, so I uh, w one of the reasons I didn't really mention James's version of it either in my article or uh, or on the podcast is and, and so I I want to preface this by saying um, James is easily one of my favorite people in the fitness industry that I am not in some sort of business relationship with. Um, really love James, really love Danny Lennon, really love Mike Tashir. Those are probably my three favorite people in the fitness industry who I don't work with in some way, shape or form. Um, 
But of the versions of effective reps floating around, I actually kind of dislike James's the most. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think so. I, I think um, so. My biggest issue with Chris's model would also be my biggest issue with James's model, but I feel like James's misses the mark even more. So yeah. I guess this is worth getting into. Yeah, so. Sure. The the article I wrote about this concept, um, I, I started off by critiquing the theoretical underpinnings of it about, you know, exactly how many reps from failure do you need to, to get to recruit all of your motor units? And are you actually maximizing per fiber tension as you are approaching failure? Um, those are... Those are, I think, important points if you're a nerd and care about the mechanistic underpinnings of a model. Um, I think that that would probably make a really boring discussion on a podcast. And especially the, the per fiber tension stuff is um, my argument is based on um, a model of motor unit fatigue uh, proposed by um, Jim Potvin and recreating that argument here would make no sense whatsoever. Cause like you, you really have to, you, you have to be able to see the images for it to make any sense whatsoever. Um, but really the thing that, um, the thing that got me kind of onto this subject in the first place is that, um, I, I, I understand the intuitive appeal of the effective reps model, but I didn't think it squared with the experimental evidence all that well. And so essentially what you have is you have um, you have several different lines of evidence you could point to to either support or critique the effective reps model. I personally think the most relevant uh, one of those lines of evidence is simply you have a, you have a study where one of two things happens, either you're, you're matching for intensity and total number of reps performed, but those reps will be performed at different proximities to failure, or you're matching for intensity and um, performing a uh, different number of reps per set, but matching the number of sets such that one group is going closer to failure and one group is staying further from failure. Um, so, so I think that that probably gives you the best apples to apples comparison to see if like the the idea of effective reps matches the experimental evidence. And so basically what you have is you have two, two sets of four studies. And one of the sets of four studies all used single joint exercises and was all performed on untrained lifters. Um, and in those four studies, it very much seems to support the idea of effective reps. So there was a study by Samson that uh, there were three groups. Two of the groups were kind of staying two reps shy of failure. One of the groups was going to failure. Uh, those three groups had pretty similar hypertrophy. However, the two groups generally stopping shy of failure were still doing one set to failure every week um, to, to know how much to progress loads by the next week. So um, all three of those groups were probably doing kind of similar numbers of effective reps and had fairly similar hypertrophy. Um, there was a study by Nobrega where had four groups, well, four conditions, and it was using a within subject design um, where one leg was, or the four conditions were 30% uh, to failure, uh, three sets to failure, 80% um, for three sets to failure, and then 30% for three sets to what the authors termed volitional interruption uh, and 80% for three sets to, again, volitional interruption. And the authors in that paper didn't define volitional interruption very well, but when you chase down some of their references, it very much seems uh, volitional interruption essentially means RPE 10. So like there were two conditions where people were actually going to failure and doing reps until they actually failed a rep. Um, and then two of the conditions were going until they didn't actually fail a rep, but they were very confident they would fail the next rep. So, so I'm pretty sure that that's what they were doing in that study. And I think for all practical purposes, most people would define that as like all four conditions going to failure. Um, cause for most, eh, I wouldn't say most exercises, but for a lot of exercises we do, 
we probably don't actually go until we fail a rep. Like failure operationally means RPE 10 a lot of times. Um, and so in that study as well, probably similar numbers of effective reps and all four conditions had similar hypertrophy. And then a uh, study by Martorelli, uh, three groups, untrained women doing bicep curls. One group was doing three sets to failure with 70% one rep max. One group was doing three sets of seven with 70% one rep max. And one group was doing four sets of seven with 70% one rep max. And like, I don't know, man, if you've ever done bicep curls to failure with, uh, with 70% of your max, you can probably do like 15 reps if you really push it. Um, so realistically that study was probably one group doing 15 effective reps per session in two groups doing none <laughs> or, or very, very few. Um, and so the kind of the direction of that study matches up with the predictions of the, of the effective reps model, but the magnitudes don't. So the three sets to failure group, uh, increased bicep cross-sectional area or, or thickness, one of the two, um, by like 17 and a half percent, um, the four sets of seven group, which again, probably wasn't doing many, if any effective reps, um, increased bicep cross-sectional area by about eight and a half percent. So it, it, it is kind of in keeping with the predictions of the model insofar as the group doing more effective reps did have more growth. Um, but one would probably expect a greater magnitude of difference. And then the three sets of seven group basically didn't grow at all. I think the increase was like 2.1%, give or take. Um, so so one, one, one could use that, argue, that study to argue in, in favor of the effective reps concept, even though it, it probably doesn't nail all of its predictions. But again, human research is messy. You generally don't expect it to line up perfectly one-to-one. -one. So, you know, you can put that as a strike in favor of effective reps. Um, and then the last one is an older study by Godot et al. Um, from back in 2004, I believe. And so what they did in that study is one group was doing four sets of 10 knee extensions. And then the other group, uh, and all of them were to failure if memory serves. Um, and then the other group was also doing four sets of 10, but they had, I believe a 30 second rest in between reps five and six, uh, during each set. Maybe it was a 10 second rest. I feel like it was 30 seconds, but it, it, it was enough of a rest that, you know, it, it would have made the final five reps easier. Um, and so they weren't taking those sets to failure. And so, um, in, in that study, the group doing, uh, the four sets of 10 to failure increased quad thickness, cross-sectional area realistically doesn't matter, um, by about 12%. And I think the group with the like 30 second break in the middle of each set increased quad size by three, 4%, give or take. Um, so, so that would also be kind of a, a prediction one would derive from the effective reps model. One group doing about 20 effective reps per session. The other group, I don't know, maybe getting two, um, since, you know, the end of that set would probably eventually get challenging, but certainly not to failure. So when you look at this, when you look at the literature on untrained lifters, you have two studies where there were probably similar numbers of effective reps and you see pretty similar hypertrophy. And you have two studies where there were um, large differences in the numbers of effective reps done, and you see large differences in hypertrophy. So in terms of studies on untrained lifters doing single joint exercises, model looks really, really good. Um, the problem is, is when you get into the studies on uh, trained lifters, it starts to break down considerably. So... Um, uh, a recent study by Karsten, um, how, how much patience does your audience have for like study by study breakdowns? No, I, I would say a lot. Continue. Oh, okay. Cause, yeah. cause I'm just rolling and I hadn't given thought to, am I putting right. people to sleep right now? I always just admire your recall, uh, <laughs> abilities when, when you start going down, you know, these rabbit holes and just, you know, reciting information like this. So I'm super impressed. I'm sure they will be. And it's, it's a good thing. So continue. Oh, uh, well, so I had all of the stuff on untrained lifters, like more or less memorized. Um, I'm going to have to look back at some notes for the train lifters, but anyway, so, um, recent study by Karsten just published this past month. 
what, what they did is they had one group doing four sets of 10 on various different exercises, mostly multi-joint, uh, to failure, and one group doing eight sets of five with so, so this was actually pretty interesting, and this isn't in my article, but this is something I got into for a mass article I'm doing over over the same article. Um, so one group, four sets of 10 to failure for a bunch of different exercises, one group doing eight sets of five um, with the intention of all of those sets being halfway to failure. The problem is I don't think the group doing eight sets of five was actually going halfway to failure. So even if we assume they were going halfway to failure, doing sets of five, if, if they did do what the authors intended, that would still be, you know, 20 effective reps per exercise versus zero because you're never getting within five reps in reserve. But I actually think it was worse than that. So the eight sets of five group, the um, what the authors did to to monitor and adjust load in that group is they have them give uh, an effort-based RPE at the end of each set. So that's not like a reps and reserve based RPE scale, but an effort-based scale. So uh, like analogous to a Borg scale. And I chased down the references they cited for using that to um, like predict and manipulate effort of resistance training. And in those two studies, they they used squat and bench press, which were two of the studies or, or two of the exercises used in the Karsten study uh, and the two exercises they used to assess strength, even though we're just talking about hypertrophy here. And in the articles they cited, they looked at sets performed at between 70 and 80 percent one rep max, which is the intensity that they would have been using in the study. And um, at a 10 percent velocity loss. The effort-based RPE for bench press was 6.8, and the effort-based RPE at a 10% velocity loss for squat was 7.6. And what they did in this study is they said um, when the effort-based RPE at the end of a set exceeded 7, they reduced load for the next set to make sure that that group wouldn't get too close to failure. And so that's important because if you're training at 70 80% one rep max, um, the total velocity loss between your first rep and the rep where you eventually fail is probably going to be somewhere on the magnitude of 50 to 70 percent. And so to get in, since velocity decreases pretty linearly across a set, uh, when you're halfway through a set of 10 reps, on average, that's going to correspond to a velocity loss of 25 to 35 percent. So if they were at an effort-based RPE of seven at just a 10% velocity loss, they were probably exceed. And if they were at 7.6 for the squat at just a 10% velocity loss, they were probably exceeding an effort-based RPE of seven prior to actually getting halfway to failure and getting to the 25 to 35% velocity loss. So I actually think the Carson study, and, and I'm getting way too into depth on this one study, but I, I think instead of one group doing four sets of 10 to failure and one group doing eight sets of five with five reps in reserve, I think it was actually one group doing four sets of 10 to failure versus one group doing eight sets of five with like seven or eight plus reps in reserve. So essentially that's your background. One group going to failure, one group not going particularly close to failure at all and would have zero effective reps. Um, and in terms of hypertrophy, the quad growth, so they looked at vastus medialis thickness, and that was very much in line with what you'd predict from effective reps. The group doing no effective reps had no quad growth. The group going to failure and getting ineffective reps had a reasonably large increase in vastus medialis thickness. So that's, that's cool. But then they also looked at changes in biceps thickness and front delt thickness, uh, neither of which were st were significantly different between groups. Um, the change in biceps thickness leaned in favor of the group going to failure. The change in anterior delt thickness actually leaned in favor of the group staying further from failure and essentially doing zero effective reps. Um, so in that study, basically, you have lower body, which supports the effective reps concept, and upper body, which is just a complete wash uh, in terms of hypertrophy between the groups and, and doesn't support the effect of reps concept. Um, then you have a study by uh, Eric Helms, one of his dissertation studies, or one of one of 
Do they call it a, a dissertation or a thesis in New Zealand? Whatever. One of the studies he did for his PhD. Um, so there were two groups in that study. One of them, loads were assigned using percentage of one rep max, and one of them, loads were assigned using um, RPE. And in both groups, they collected RPE after every set. And what they saw is that um, the, the RPE-based group was probably going a little bit closer to failure on squats. So they were doing uh, squat and bench press in that study, and they were looking at quad and pec growth. Uh, and, and what they saw is that the the group um, using RPE was probably going maybe about a rep closer to failure um, on squats throughout most of the study. So, you know, should theoretically be getting in a handful more effective reps, but maybe not enough to make that much of a difference. But for bench press, um, the percentage-based group was at a RPE of between five and six. And so again, this is like a reps and reserve based RPE scale. So they were training with four to five reps in the tank the entire session or, or the entire study and theoretically would have gotten in virtually no effective reps for their pecs um, versus the, R, the RPE group, which was mostly between kind of starting at a six RPE, getting all the way up to about a nine RPE. So they would have been getting, I don't know, probably five or six times more effective reps for their pecs throughout the course of the study than the percentage group. Um, but in, in terms of both quad growth and pec growth in the Helm study, similar similar between groups in spite of the, the huge difference in effective reps, especially for the pecs. Um, then, let's see, there are two more. Ah, yes, uh, Pareja Blanco. So... Uh, study from 2014. What they did in this study is they um, monitored monitored each set based on velocity loss. So essentially, um, they had people doing squats and they looked at the velocity on the first rep of each set. They were instructed to move every rep as fast as possible, looked at the velocity on the first rep, and then one group would terminate each set when their velocity decreased by 40%. And the other group would terminate the set when their velocity decreased by 20%. Um, both of the groups were doing four sets per workout. So the number of sets was equated, but one of the groups was allowed twice the, the amount of velocity loss. And so in that study, um, the 20% velocity loss group probably did virtually no effective reps. Um, so there was a chart that showed... Um, how many reps each group performed in different kind of velocity bands. So below 0.3 meters per second, that's probably your last rep before failure. Three to, uh, 0.3 to 0.4 meters per second, that's probably two to three-ish reps to failure. Uh, and then 0.4 to 0.5 meters per second, that's probably four to five-ish reps from failure. Uh, if you've done much velocity testing with squats, like that's that's how it tends to work out for most people. Um, and so it, it reported how many reps both groups performed both overall, how many sets were taken to failure in both groups, and then how many um, reps were performed in each one of those velocity zones. And so essentially what you see is if, if you operationalize effective reps to mean reps performed at below about 0.5 meters per second, which would probably correspond in the squat to about five reps from failure, uh, the 40% velocity loss group probably did somewhere around 90 effective reps over the course of the study, and the 20% velocity loss group probably did maybe 10. Um, so about a ninefold difference in effective reps. They looked at um, changing cross-sectional area of the entire quadriceps, and they also looked at uh, changes in fiber cross-sectional area of the vastus lateralis. Uh, changes in fiber cross-sectional area weren't uh, significantly or, or meaningfully different between groups. I want to say it was like, I don't know, 10% versus 9% or so. Um, so no, no meaningful or significant difference in fiber cross-sectional area change. The change in total quad cross-sectional area did kind of lean in favor of the 40% velocity loss group, but it wasn't a significant difference. So it was like 7.7% .7 versus 4.6%. Um, which again, wasn't a significant difference, probably due to low sample size, did lean in favor of the group doing quote unquote, or more quote unquote effective reps, 
but we're talking about a ninefold difference in effective reps and one of the groups basically doing none, like maybe 10 over the course of like a 10, 12 week study. Um, so again, the findings of that study don't really match up with what you'd predict from the effective reps model. Uh, and then most recently there was a, or not most recently, Karsten was the most recent, but prior to the Karsten study, most recently, uh, there was a study by Carroll, um, out of ETSU. And in that study, they assigned training. So one group was called the rep max group and the other group was called the relative intensity group. The rep max group did, they were doing mostly three sets of each exercise throughout the course of the study. And they were only looking at quad growth. Um, and the only exercise that they were doing that really trained the quads hard was probably squats. So uh, I think in one week they did some step ups and like they did some clean pulls here and there. But really the, the, the major training for their quads was squats. And they were squatting twice a week. And the rep max group doing mostly three sets throughout the course of the study. And the last set terminated in failure. So it probably looks something like set one, eh, about two reps shy from failure, about three effective reps. Set two, probably about a rep shy from failure, probably about four effective reps. And then last set, two failure, five effective reps. And they were doing that Monday and Friday. And then the relative intensity group, um, it was training assigned based on a percentage of a theoretical set rep best. And you may ask yourself, how would you actually know what that is? And you don't. Um, so I followed up their references and it was just based on reps in reserve. So uh, estimated reps in reserve after the first set and after the last set. And so from that, we can get an idea of how many effective reps that that group was doing. Um, they were training some somewhere in the neighborhood of like two to four reps from failure for most of their training sessions on Monday. And then on Friday, they were staying super far from failure. So in, in the relative intensity group, the way their program worked is like Monday and Wednesday were harder training days and Friday was easy. But since they were just squatting twice per week, that worked out to one hard squat day and one easy squat day. So the hard squat day was still easier than the, than the rep max groups squat day. Um, still probably, like I said, two to four reps from failure for pretty much everything. The easy squat day even further from failure, probably like no effective reps on that day. Um, and so in that study, it actually runs exactly opposite from expect reps concept. Um, they looked at quad thickness, quad cross-sectional area, type one muscle fiber cross-sectional area and type two cross-sectional area, or maybe mean, mean fiber area and, uh, maybe vastus lateralis and rectus femoris thickness, whatever. It doesn't really matter. They had they had four different measures of quad growth. Um, the change in quad cross-sectional area was significantly different, leaning in favor, in favor of the rep max group that was doing fewer effective reps. And the other three measures kind of leaned in favor of the rep max group as well. Um, so in that study, the group doing fewer effective reps got considerably more quad growth. Um, one thing to note about that study is the overall training volume was reasonably high and they were also doing two days of conditioning. So I've seen the argument put forth that, oh, maybe the rep max group was overtraining. I don't think that that's the case. There were two studies, pub there were two papers published based off of the same study. They also looked at changes in strength and the changes in strength were similar between the groups and like strength increased pre to post training in both groups. You don't tend to see strength gains longitudinally if one group is overtraining. Uh, and additionally, like, like I said, the only major quad training they were doing is twice a week. And for all except one week of the study, it was three sets. And you're going to have a hard time telling me six sets of squats per week with only two of the sets taken to failure is going to overtrain most people. Um, so anyway, Overall, like I said, when you look at the studies on single joint exercises and untrained lifters, a lot of support for the effective reps concept. When you look at the studies on multi-joint exercises using trained lifters, um, it gets pretty shaky pretty quick. You have one measure in the Karsten study that does seem to support the effective reps idea. 
You have Bench in the Helm study, which really seems to go against that concept. Huge difference in effective reps, very similar hypertrophy. Um, the the Pareja Blanco study kind of depends how you look at it because maybe the group going closer to failure, maybe you you got a little bit more whole muscle growth, even though muscle fiber change muscle fiber size change was pretty similar. But you're still talking about a, a not statistically significant difference in spite of like a ninefold difference in effective reps performed. And then you have the Carroll study, which runs completely opposite to what you'd expect given the effective reps model. So th- that was that was the main reason I wanted to to talk about it because I think so like a lot of my audience is nerds and if people who are like kind of nerdy and like really into quantitative shit, I think we have a tendency to to come across an appealing uh, predictive model that that seems to be based on physiology that makes sense. Um, and seems to square with some of the experimental evidence and be like, oh yeah, this is good shit. This is something I can quantify. I like quantifying stuff. Pump this shit into my veins. Um, whereas like, I, I think I think the problem is that effective reps is a nice idea, but at least in a fair number of contexts, it doesn't square with the experimental evidence all that well. Um, like as soon as you get beyond untrained lifters and single joint exercises, it starts looking quite a bit iffier. Um, so to circle back to, to where I started before I started breaking down all of those studies, um, the reason I kind of like uh, James's concept of effective reps the least is Chris's concept at least says all five of these reps are worth the same. There are five effective reps. I'm not going to discriminate between, you know, the the fifth rep from failure and the last one before failure. Whereas James's concept, it seems more graded. Whereas, so basically like the last two reps before failure are like super, super important. And like four and five reps out are a little bit less important. And so um, that squares with the evidence worse than Chris's model. So, uh, and again, so I, I, really like and respect I don't know Chris so I can't say I like him but I do respect him and I do like a lot of his work um but I I'm I don't I just don't think their model up with the evidence that well and James's probably matches up worse than Chris's so um <laughs> anyway that that's why I didn't really mentioned James's effective reps concept that much up to the, up to this point because a Chris's is the more popular one. It's the one I see people talking about more. And two, um, yeah, I, I I think James's has bigger issues probably. No, awesome. And uh, yeah, very much appreciate the breakdown of the research. And I will admit, <clears throat> excuse me, when the concept, uh, like I was aware of the concept uh, way back, and as it started to gain popularity, uh, I definitely saw it as a very cool way to yeah start to quantify you know how much bang for your buck you're getting within a set and that was really cool but the more i sort of uh thought about it and was talking about it i started to have more questions and answers uh, specifically as it related to training level of advancement because it just didn't make sense to me that yeah the stimulus per repetition you know after an rp5 um, you know, would be the same from a beginner to someone who's advanced, um, you know, given that they're lifting heavier weights, they have, you know, better motor, you know, recruitment uh, ability, essentially, and all those sorts of things. And I started to, yeah, question how it would play out over different exercises, given, you know, the length tension relationship, uh, changing on certain lifts with, yeah, most isolation exercises, like a curl having the most difficult part um, you know, in the active range versus something like a squat mm-hmm. or a bench press, having the most difficult part in the uh, stretch position. And I just had more questions. And it was really cool when your article came out because I was like, yeah, shit, this is kind of important. Like we can't just um, take a myopic view of, you know, the stimulus uh, per set. Like there's a lot of uh, nuance that uh, comes with 
you know, changes in uh, training experience as well as the type of exercise. Uh, so I guess what are the meat and potato takeaways uh, from uh, your assessment of the literature in terms of training level of advancements um, and the different types of exercises uh, in terms of the stimulus that we get from them? So, okay, so here, here are just some of my hot takes. I think that, um, so I'm not crazy about proxy measures in general. Um, I think that, I think that training, there's both a science to it and an art to it. And I think when you start quantifying stuff too much, it gives people, uh, a level of confidence that's not quite justified. Like we, we don't know that much, right? Like it's it's not that we know nothing about how to build muscle, but if you if you sat someone down and you said, go through the scientific literature and explain to me exactly how the process of muscle growth occurs, don't give me a cop out answer that's like MPS minus MPB because like that seems almost tautologically true. But you know, how do we get from point A, the stimulus, to point B, you know, net protein balance? longitudinally over time. Um, tell me how all of those factors are going to be affected by different exercises, different proximities to failure, different ranges of motion. Um, how many sets should you be doing? What should your tempo be? What should your like internal versus external focus be? Like, we don't know that shit. Like you, you can't, you can't go in the literature and, and tell someone exactly the best way to train to maximize hypertrophy. Like you just can't. And so I think that I think that proxy measures that get popular are useful for giving people a sense of control because people like a sense of control. But I think one of the problems you can run into is then people start conceptualizing training as purely a science instead of a mixture of like science and art. There's you know, part of it is like your feel as a lifter or your experience as a coach working with certain types of clients. Um, and it's, I mean, like the, the very, very foundational principles are probably the exact same for everyone. But once you get beyond that, like there's probably considerable in individual differences as well. So one of the, one of the, um, I guess arguments that's going on that I unintentionally waded into uh, when I publish this article, is there is a huge group of people, and, and I think that this is like most of the evidence-based fitness community, quote unquote, that um, you know probably when we were young, we got our workouts from muscle magazines, and they they were saying you got to train to failure all the time if you're ever going to grow, and we tried that, and like we made some progress, and then some people were like, oh, guess what? You actually don't have to go to failure. Like you're, you're still going to get a stimulus stain a few reps shy. Maybe you'll recover a little bit quicker. And then we tried that and we're like, well, oh shit, like th this is actually working pretty well. Um, and so I think some people based on their experience found that, oh, maybe slightly submaximal training, doing a few more sets. That seems to be working pretty well for growth. We've tried the other thing. This is working better. And then there's another whole group of people that I was completely unaware of, um, because I mean, like the part of the industry I see is the part of the industry that I interact with and, and who follow me um, and who I and who I think assume that I think certain things about hypertrophy that are identical to the people I'm surrounded with. And anyway, so they came up, um, you know, listening to the people who preached submaximal training, le leaving a few reps in the tank, doing more sets. And then they tried that for a while. They made some progress. They stalled out. They found like the the like quote unquote bros, like the hardcore bodybuilder folks who were saying, nah, dude, you don't have to do as many sets, but like fucking push everything to failure, blood and guts, like ev everything you got, every set. And they try it and it fucking works. And then they grow more. And so I think like it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if there's just like differences between the types of stimuli that people respond best to. Um which no single model is ever going to account for. Um, I mean, like I, I've seen it enough times in my training or, or, or like in my coaching that I would be stunned if that was not the case where 
Like I try something that works with 90% of my clients with, with a new client, doesn't do shit. Try something that in general kind of goes against my biases and lo and behold, it works great. Um, and then, you know, the, the opposite can occur as well. Like Anyway, so I, I think that one, a proxy measure isn't going to account for for individual differences. And two, I think as far as proxy measures go, effective reps isn't bad. Like I, I think it's better than what has come before it, but I, I think that there's a tendency sometimes for people to op to optimize for proxy measures instead of um I don't know, just the tr the process of training itself, you know. Well, so that comes right. Yeah, yeah. So we, we saw this with volume load back in the day. So um, people moved on from volume load to hard sets, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. So maybe if, if someone came up in the fitness industry today, they may not see that many people talking about volume load anymore. Volume load generally replaced time under tension. That's another proxy measure. Uh, but I mean, when I came up volume everywhere and you would see people coming up with really dumb workouts that optimized for volume load because volume load is the idea that you do more volume, you grow more, uh, volume was operationalized as volume load sets times reps times weight. And so you would see people making arguments like, Oh man, you got to do barbell bench press instead of dumbbell bench press. Cause you can lift more weight and therefore it's going to build more muscle. And it's like, do I think that barbell bench is going to be way better for pet growth than dumbbell bench? No, like I don't, um, or, or even like, God, g get rid of fucking flies. You can barely use any weight at all. It's completely worthless. You're going to build 10 times more muscle than doing flies. Like probably not dude. Like both of those exercises can hit your pecs really hard, you know? Um, so people optimized for volume load instead of just optimizing for good training and, you know, seeing what helped them make progress or helped their pro their clients make progress in the past and over time and just leaning into those things. And so, yeah, people did dumb shit when they were optimizing for the proxy measure of volume load. I, I think that if people optimize for the proxy measure of effective reps, they'll probably wind up with um, better programs than optimizing for volume load. Like I, I think as far as proxy measures go, it is a better proxy measure, but I, I still think it has drawbacks. So for example, here's some shit I saw on Instagram the other day. Um, so if, let, let me give you two training programs and you as someone who is jacked and who coaches people, tell me which one you think is gonna build more muscle, okay? So one, you have four sets of 10 to failure. Two, you have 10 doubles at RPE seven. Which one do you think is going to build more muscle? Doubles all the way, bro. <laughs> no. Come on. So, so, <laughs> so, 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 to value for sure. <laughs> so obviously the 10 doubles at RPE seven, <laughs> stupid. Like you, you, that's not going to do shit. I mean, it, it, that might actually not be a terrible way to train for strength, but th that's not going to be a good way to train for hypertrophy. But, uh, that is one rep that is five from failure and one rep that's four from failure. That's two effective reps. You do 10 sets. That's 20 effective reps. That's, that's the same as four sets of 10 to failure. Like, and, and you know, I, I don't, I haven't yet seen an epidemic of people doing stuff like that, but that, that is a, a literal and perfectly rational interpretation of the effective reps model that illustrates what can happen when people get wound up on a proxy measure rather than just, just fucking training, you know? And so I, I think, I think I, so I have my own issues with the effective reps model itself, but then I also have issues with proxy measures in general that people put too much trust and emphasis on just because any proxy is going to be inherently flawed and, can be incredibly ab abused to get really dumb training ideas out of. Yeah, man, you bring up a lot of really good points there. And I guess uh, to summarize, the the model itself can be useful in the sense that it draws attention to the necessity to train hard and make sure that you are doing something within 
a set and not uh, yeah train too far from failure because we know that training hard is in essence necessary for growth, um, but it's not without its limitations. And I think your article was the first real sort of stab at breaking down the concept, um, you know, to see you know how it holds up. And I think that's really useful. So for all the listeners uh, that stuck it out this far, uh, be sure to check out Greg's article. Um, oh, can, will... can can I can I just slide yeah. back in here real quick? Slide. So you you asked you asked for practical takeaways and I gave absolutely none. Zero. Um, I didn't want to pick I, you up I, on that, but that's okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's fine. I I just I got distracted and went it's down good. a rabbit hole. So in terms of practical takeaways, I think I, I so like you just said, I think the basic concept of effective reps is solid. I think that if you're training for hypertrophy and you're terminating sets really far from failure for all or most of your training, it's probably not going to be all that effective. Um, I think that, I think that in general, some people may do a little bit better pushing a greater proportion of their sets to failure. Um, I think some people may do a little bit better pushing a greater proportion of their sets to, I don't know, maybe an eight RPE, a couple reps left in the tank. I, strongly doubt that virtually anyone grows the best being like four or five reps from failure. Like I, I just don't, I haven't seen that in practice. I haven't heard anecdotes of that. Like it's, I, I just don't think there's much theoretical or practical support for that concept. So you should be at least pretty close to failure, if not going to failure. I do think on the concept of training to failure, I don't think it's a bad idea for most people to spend some time going to failure. And, and I think that this is something that is easy for people kind of my age who've, who've been around the industry the length of time I have to take for granted. Um, if, if someone, so assuming I had never heard of RPE before, if someone told me, Hey, you're going to do a set of bench press and you're going to go two reps shy of failure, or you're going to do a set of squats and you're going to stop three reps shy of failure. I would be able to do that even if I had no experience with RPE based training, because when I came up and I assume when you came up and when, when most people around our age came up, like training to failure was just what you fucking did, man. Um, or, you know, if you were a power lifter, you know, maybe you do, something else for your main lifts, but you're, you're pushing multiple sets of accessory lifts to failure all the time. Like that, that was just the culture. That's what we all did. And so when someone said, Oh, maybe stop two reps shy of failure, we'd, we'd all gone to failure enough that we knew what two reps shy felt like. And you know, maybe not for like delt raises or tricep extensions, but for some or a deadlift two reps shy of failure is still really hard. Like that, that's not an easy set. Like it's, it's technically submaximal. You could technically do more, but if you do like a set of 10 with a legit 12 rep max load, that's a fucking hard set of squats. And those last two reps, like you're going to feel like you're dying the whole time. If you actually went and did all 12, like that, that's eight RPE doesn't mean easy. Eight RPE means like really hard, but just not going until there's blood coming out of your eyes. And I, and I think that, um, I think that a lot of people who are newer to the industry and have been training for a shorter period of time and were raised on, you know, folks like us or like Eric Helms or Mike Tashir or like pretty much anyone. I actually don't know if you advocate RP based training or submaximal, but what, whatever. Yes, if someone came, okay. Okay. So if someone came up listening to us and they're like, Oh, keep, keep a few reps left in the tank all the time, whatever. And they never spent any significant period of time training to failure. Like I, I see this all the time when I'm like scrolling down the gram or even like some of my own clients. Um, you know, I, I tell someone to do something, leave two reps in reserve. They send a video. I look at the video and I'm like, well, I've never seen this person go to failure, but I would bet a hefty sum of money that they had two, more than two reps left on that set. Um, and so typically what I'll do is the next week I'll prescribe them the same load that they just did and prescribe them a set to failure, say, you know, get a spotter, do as many as you can. And 
more often than not, what they thought was an RPE 8 was like an RPE 5. Um, you know, because if, if you're strong enough, and especially for like squats and deadlifts, RPE 5 and 6 still isn't easy. Like it's it's still a lot of weight and you are still putting effort into it. Um, I mean, that's that's like Shaco. If you're doing triples at 80% until the cows come home, 80% is like an eight rep max for most people. Um, you, it's probably like an RP five, maybe pushing six or seven by the end of a set. But if you've ever done Shaco, you're not going to say, Oh, that program's easy. You know, it's sub maximal easiest training I ever did. Like it's hard. Um, but yeah, so, um, I think, I think people today just in general, not every, but like the, the people coming up, I think that they're probably worse at using RP than, than we were when we were first introduced to it. Um, so I do think that there is a lot of general value in spending some time where you train to failure more frequently. Uh, one, just so I, I do think that there are some people who do legitimately just respond a lot better to training to failure. And so like, if that's you, you spend some time training to failure, you make sick gains and you're like, hell yeah, this is life. This is what I'm about cool. You tried something, it worked for you. Now go run with it. Have a fun training career. If you give it a shot and, you know, maybe it still doesn't work that that great for you, but now you have experience, you know what training to failure feels like. And if someone says RP8, you know what an RP8 is. Um, and I I have a hard time really believing people can can do a great job with submaximal training if if they don't know what maximal training feels like. So... I, I do think I totally agree. I think it gives people a reference point and I've certainly seen yeah. this in practice as well is that if you don't know where the limits lie, you can't dial back from the limits. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely agree that, uh, yeah, training to failure has huge utility in that sense. Um, so, so that's one practical takeaway. Another practical takeaway is I think that, um, I think that for for compound lifts, and especially here, I'm thinking squat and deadlift, probably not a bad idea to leave a few reps in the tank most of the time, um, just because for those two lifts specifically, or, or like close variants of those two lifts, I think the risk to reward ratio of going to failure probably just isn't worth it. Um, for a lot of other compound exercises and, and virtually any single joint exercise, I think that um, I think that if if you're training for strength, a whole different beast entirely. If you're training for hypertrophy, I think that going to failure, it, if nothing else, idiot proofs your training. Um, if you're, you know, it, it, it's it's easy. Even if you know how to use RP well, it's easy to sandbag. Some days you're just not feeling good, but if you, if you're supposed to go all the way to failure and you push until you actually fail a rep you know, regardless of what model of hypertrophy you're working with, you did something that said you, you caused a goddamn stimulus. There's no way you didn't. Um, so I, I don't, I don't think training to failure is necessary, but certainly for a lot of compound movements and, and virtually all single joint movements, I think that it's a really good way to idiot proof your training, um, and kind of lazy proof your training. If, if you're someone who, who knows that you have a tendency to, to slack, if, you know, given a little bit of leash. Um, and then I think my biggest takeaway is that your best, your best proxy for training and the, 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 the thing that you would quantify that you should pay the most mind to is just, are you improving? Uh, you know, are, are you doing the same sets and reps with more weight? Are you doing, the same weight for more sets and reps. Like, is there quantifiable progress going on? Um, and then if there is cool, like I, I think, pe I think a lot of people fiddle with their programs before they should. Um, they read a, a fun new article online that's promoting some sort of training method. And they're like, Oh, that sounds really cool. I'm going to go overhaul my program. Like, no, if you're making progress, just stick with it. Um, progress is, is a beautiful thing. And even if it's slow, if it's slow for years, you still make a shit ton of progress. Like progress is beautiful. If you're making progress, don't mess with anything. If you're not making progress 
and you're just generally feeling fresh all the time, you probably need to train harder. Training harder can mean a few different things. It could mean more challenging exercise selection, depending on on the exercises you, you currently have in your program. It could mean pushing closer to failure if you're if you are training pretty far from failure. It could mean doing more sets. Uh, could mean increasing your frequency. But if you're not making progress, like something quantifiable isn't improving, and you you feel good and fresh all the time, you probably just need to train more. Like that's probably the thing that's holding you back. If you're not making some sort of quantifiable progress and you are feeling achy, worn down all the time then I think first place you need to look is what's going on outside the gym. Are you sleeping well? Are you eating enough protein? Are you, you know, depending on what your goals are for weight gain or loss at the time, like is appropriate going on there? Like, you know, are you losing weight when you're supposed to be at maintenance? Are you dropping weight really fast when you're supposed to be in a small deficit? Whatever. Like, are you generally eating as many calories as you intend to eat? Um, are you managing stress to the best of your ability, which may not be great. You know, if you have like a new kid or a super stressful job, like you'll still be quite stressed, but are you doing as much as you can to manage stress? If those things aren't taken care of, I think that that's probably an ideal place to look. If, if you're on a program that was previously getting you results and then especially if something outside the gym changed and got worse and you're not making results, if possible, change the stuff outside the gym. The program that worked before probably still works and you're just not giving yourself a, a adequate environment to adapt to training. Uh, and if all of that stuff is taken care of and you're not making progress and feel worn down all the time, it's probably the opposite problem of the first one. You're probably training too hard. Maybe it's a little bit too close to failure. Maybe you're doing too many sets. Maybe your exercise selection doesn't agree with you and you could choose exercises that would train the same muscles, but be a, a little bit less systemically stressful. Um, but whatever it is, just pull back a little bit. And, and I think, I don't know. I, I think that that's, that, that is my model of training. And I think that it's sensible. generally, un, I think <laughs> it's generally uncontroversial. <laughs> yeah. And, and the only, the only proxy measure I care about is, are you doing better than you were a month ago? Yeah, man, I uh, couldn't agree more. And I think that's a really uh, good place to end this discussion with some very practical and uh, logical ways to assess training outcomes, because at the end of the day, they are the best proxy essentially for muscle growth. Uh, if you're getting stronger in you know moderate repetition ranges across multiple sets over time, you're looking more jacked, you're filling out your t-shirts and your pants, then you're good to go. And yeah, guys, I recommend you check out all of Greg's work over at Stronger by Science, the articles, the podcast, check out Mass. And uh, thank you very much for your time, Greg. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you.